Now, tonight I want to preach about a subject that you often hear in, in business circles. Um, you might have heard about a, uh, a thing called continuous improvement, like maybe a continuous improvement process. Uh, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll find it says a continual improvement process, also often called a continuous, uh, sorry, a continual or a continuous improvement process, is an ongoing effort to improve products, services, or processes. These efforts can seek incremental improvement over time or breakthrough improvement all at once. Delivery processes are constantly evaluated and improved in the light of their efficiency, effectiveness, and flexibility. According to the Institute of Quality Assurance, continuous improvement is a gradual, never-ending change which is focused on increasing the effectiveness and or efficiency of an organisation to fulfil its policy and objectives. It's not limited to quality initiatives, improvement in business strategy, business results, customer, employee and supplier relationships can be subject to continual improvement. Put simply, it means getting better all the time. Now, there's a short excerpt I just want to read you here from. This was a book that I read earlier this year, and um, it touches on the subject of continuous improvement, and it's entitled Marginal Gains. And it says, The fate of British cycling changed one day in 2003. The organisation, which was the governing body for professional cycling in Great Britain, had recently hired Dave Brailsford as its new performance director. At the time, professional cyclists in Great Britain had endured nearly 100 years of mediocrity. Since 1908, British riders had won just a single gold medal at the Olympic Games, and they had fared even worse in cycling's biggest race, the Tour de France. In 110 years, no British cyclist had ever won the event. So it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. It's like, hey, if you're from Britain and you're a cyclist, it's, it, it, well, unimpressive is what it is. In fact, the performance of British riders had been so underwhelming that one of the top bike manufacturers in Europe refused to sell bikes to the team because they were afraid that it would hurt sales if other professionals saw the Brits using the air. I mean, how bad is that? Well, we want to buy your bikes. Like, no, we don't want you to buy them because that's going to make people think that our bikes are rubbish. That's how bad it was. Brailsford had been hired to put British cycling on a new trajectory. What made him different from previous coaches was his relentless commitment to a strategy that he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains, which was the philosophy of searching for a tiny margin of improvement in everything you do. Brailsford said, the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could, think of, think of sorry, everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike, and then improve it by 1%, you will get a significant in increase when you put them all together. So a little change here, a little change here, a little change there. Brailsford and his coaches began by making small adjustments you might expect from a professional cycling team. They redesigned the bike seats to make them more comfortable. They rubbed alcohol on the tyres for better grip. They asked riders to wear electrically heated overshorts to maintain ideal muscle temperature <coughs> while riding. And they used biofeedback sensors to monitor how each athlete responded to a particular workout. The team tested various fabrics in a wind tunnel and had their outdoor riders switch to indoor racing suits, which proved to be lighter and more aerodynamic. So made all these changes that are just you'd think you'd, you'd make that to make a cyclist or a bike go better. But they didn't stop there. Brailsford and his team continued to find 1% improvements in overlooked and unexpected areas. They tested different types of massage gels to see which one led to the fastest muscle recovery. They hired a surgeon to teach each rider the best way to wash their hands and to reduce the chances of catching a cold. I was getting pretty extreme. They determined the type of pillow and mattress that led to the best night's sleep for each rider. They even painted the inside of the team truck white, which helped them spot little bits of dust that would normally slip by unnoticed, but could degrade the performance of the finely tuned bikes. As these and hundreds of other small improvements accumulated, the results came faster than anyone could have imagined. Just five years after Brailsford took over, the British cycling team dominated the road and track cycling events at the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, where they won an astounding 60% of the gold medals available. That's a big change. Four years later, when the Olympic Games came to London, the Brits raised the bar as they set nine Olympic records and seven world records. That same year, Bradley Wiggins became the first British cyclist to win the Tour de France. The next year, his teammate, 
Chris Froome won the race. And he would go on to win again in 2015, 2016, 2017, giving the British team five Tour de France victories in six years. They actually, ended up, um, they actually had six in seven years because they won in 2018 as well. Yeah. During the 10-year span from 2007 to 2017, British cyclists won 178 World Championships and 66 Olympic or Paralympic gold medals and captured five Tour de France victories in what is widely regarded as the most successful run in cycling history. Now here's the thing, how does this happen? How does a team of previously ordinary athletes transform into world champions with tiny changes that at the first glance would seem to make a modest difference at best? Why do small improvements accumulate into such remarkable results and how can you replicate this in the things that you're doing Basically, what he describes here is he goes on, he says, it's, what it's about, it's about the aggregation of marginal gains. And I was a little bit, and a little bit, and a little bit adding up together. He says, it's so easy to overestimate the importance of one defining moment. Just one thing. And often we can find this. I mean, some of, some, some of the people here are interested in competing in sport. And often you kind of think, well, if, what's that one thing? If I could just find out what this person does. What's that one thing? If I did that one thing, then that would make the big improvement. But the fact is what it is. It's actually the little things. The little things making small improvements on a daily basis. Too often we convince ourselves that massive success requires massive action, whether it's losing weight, building a business, writing a book, winning a championship, or achieving any other goal. We put pressure on ourselves to make some earth-shattering improvement that everyone will talk about. Meanwhile, improving by 1% isn't particularly notable. Sometimes it's not even noticeable, but it can be far more meaningful, especially in the long run. The difference a tiny improvement can make over time is astounding. Here's how the math works out. If you can get better, get 1% better each day for one year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time you're done, at the end of one year. Just 1% per day. Okay? Conversely, if you get 1% worse each day for one year, you'll decline nearly down to zero. Okay? That, that's, that's how much you think, oh, it's just a little bit, just a tiny little difference. But 1% is, is an amazing thing. Because the thing is, what that means is that the things you do daily, those little things, those habits... We've talked about this before. The habits that you do. Remember Jesus was someone who had habits? Yep. Remember? He went, to, went into the synagogue and stood up for to read, as was his custom. That was his habit. That's what he did. And so here's the thing. In the beginning, there's basically no difference. If you do something that's going to make you 1% better, you might not even be able to see it. You might not even be able to notice it. Or 1% worse. It's not going to make a big difference. But over time, the impact is going to be huge. As time goes on, these small improvements or declines, they compound. And it ends up being a very big gap. You know, I mean, think about, you know, some of you guys, you play squash. Think about, what's the difference if someone just hits it a foot closer to the wall than someone else does? You might, it's not really a big difference. But if they're consistently doing that, it's a foot closer. That means it's a foot further away from the tee you've got to go compared to the other person. Well, you do that once, you do it again, rally after rally after rally. All of a sudden, this person's travelled a kilometre further than you have. Haven't they? They've gone this extra, all that extra time, they're more tired, all those, even though it just seems small. Okay, And says what he says, look, it won't impact you much today, this tiny change, but as time goes on, these small improvements or declines, they compound and suddenly there's a big gap between people who make slightly better decisions on a daily basis and those who don't. That's why small choices don't make much of a difference at the time, they don't seem to, but they add up long term. Um, on a related note, he says, look, this is why I love setting a schedule for important things and also planning for failure, because we're, we're going to mess up sometimes. Yeah. Plan for that failure, and, and this, this author, he uses what he calls the never miss twice rule. In other words, if you've got some habits you want to do every day, if you have a day, what, what say something happens and you don't do it, then he says, what he says is basically, the next day, the thing that he missed, that's the first thing he does. The very first thing he does. So that's the essential thing, and that gets done. He says, I know it's not a big deal if I make a mistake or slip up on a habit every now and then. It's the compound effect of not getting back on track. That's what causes the problems. If you set a schedule and you never miss twice, you can prevent the errors from snowballing, getting worse and worse and worse. You know, if you're on a diet and you go off and have one, you know, blowout meal somewhere, that's not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything. But what happens if you do that for the next meal and the next meal and the next meal? That's the thing. Someone once said that success is a few dis simple disciplines practiced every day, while failure is simply a few errors in judgment repeated every day. I mean, to be honest, you probably won't find yourself in the Tour de France anytime soon, but the concept of aggregating marginal gains can be useful all the same. Most people love to talk about success, 
and, and life in general as an event. You know, we talk about losing 50 pounds or building a business or winning the Tour de France. Or those, those are events. But the truth is that most of the significant things in life are not standalone events. That what they are really is the sum of all those little moments. It's those little moments when you choose to do something a little bit better or a little bit worse. Aggregating those marginal gains can make a massive difference. Okay? And so, here's the thing. You might say it's interesting, but I mean, really, what, what did that have to do with the Bible? Well, hopefully, the reason you came to church tonight was to learn the Bible. You know, to learn what the Bible has to say, not to listen to a motivational speech. As interesting as to say, this is what this British cycling team has done, that's really interesting. Maybe I can improve in whatever area. But look, we just read 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 10. It says, And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Look at verse number 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Now, throughout the Bible, we are exhorted, we are encouraged to walk in a way that pleases God. And God desires us to do what? To increase and to abound throughout our lives. We often um, sing Joshua chapter 1, and verse number 8. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, This book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Notice it's a daily thing. Day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Does God want us to prosper? Does God want us to have good success? Absolutely he does. Now when I'm saying, you know, God wants us to prosper, I'm not talking about necessarily financial prosperity. You know, I mean the Bible, the Bible actually the Bible warns about that. Look at um, 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Just while you're in Thessalonians, just after Thessalonians, you'll find 1 Timothy. Look at chapter number 6 of 1 uh, Timothy, verse number 9. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, o man of God, flee these things. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Okay, and so notice, it's important, he says, look, flee from these things. That's why, although I do, the Bible says, God wants us to prosper. God wants us to have success. But every time I mention that, I underline the fact. You want a desire to be rich? God says the love of money is the root of all evil. Turn us to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. You see, God wants us to abound. He wants us to increase. He wants us to abound. But there's particular areas that he wants us to abound in. Look at um, 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse number 3. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. It says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I think godliness, that's something God wants us to abound in. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruptions in the world through lust, and beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God does want us to abound in all these different virtues. And these are things that, look, you're not going to just suddenly become godly. You're not just going to suddenly become filled with knowledge. You're not just going to suddenly become, you know, temperate. These are things that you have to add. You have to increase and improve in all these different areas. And, of course, God is going to help with that. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. It's not that you're doing it by yourself. God's going to help you. Now, there is no doubt about it that God does want us to abound in particularly good works. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And indeed, so further and we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received us, how you ought to talk and please God, so you would abound more and more. God wants us to abound in good works. Now, I love to quote Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. And nine, for by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is gift of God, not of works. I always say that over and over and over again. But we need to remember what it says in verse number 10. What does it say in verse number 10? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 
So it's great, we're saved by faith. It's not of works. But God wants us to do works. I'll say, quote Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Okay? But then, once again, Titus chapter 3, verse number 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. How often? Constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Notice that. It's something you've got to keep up. It's something you have to maintain. These things are good and profitable unto men. So here's the question. How do we maintain good works, though? How can we increase and abound in good works? Well, I want to read you something here, and this is, um, this is quite interesting, because this is talking about particularly, I've mentioned to you before what it says in Habakkuk 2.2. The prophet says, write the vision, make it plain on tables, that he may run that readeth it. This is important. If you've got some goal you're striving towards, it's important. Write the vision. Write it down. It's very, very important. In fact, this covers lots of, lots of areas. Um, Maureen was just talking to me earlier today about it's amazing how it clarifies your thoughts. When you, when you put pen to paper, yeah. it actually helps you think. Yeah. Okay? It's, it's a very important thing to do. But also when it comes to getting things done, when it comes to getting things done, write it down. Make a list of the things that you need to do. I was supposed to bring along the, um, the Bible um, checklist things tonight. I didn't write it down, and I forgot to bring it. Okay, but here's the thing. Let me just read you this. This says here, checklists. In 2004, nine hospitals in Michigan began implementing a new procedure in their intensive care units. Almost overnight, healthcare professionals were stunned with its success. Three months after it began, the procedure had cut the infection rate of ICU patients by 66%. Think about that, two-thirds. A two thing. So you're in intensive care, you're in pretty bad shape. You don't want to have some infection going on. You really don't. Well, guess what? They cut the infection rate by two-thirds. Within 18 months, this one method had saved $75 million in healthcare expenses. Best of all, the single intervention saved the lives of more than 1,500 people in just a year and a half. So what was, this, what was this amazing invention? The strategy was immediately published in a blockbuster paper for the New England Journal of Medicine. This miracle, medical miracle was also simpler than you could ever imagine. It was a checklist. That's all it was. It was a checklist. The checklist strategy implemented at, Mi at Michigan hospitals was named the Keystone ICU Project. It was led by a physician named Peter Pronovost and later popularised by writer Atul uh, Gawande. In Gawande's best-selling best book, The Checklist Manifesto, he describes how Pronovost's simple checklist could drive such dramatic results. In the following quote, Gawande explains one of the checklists that was used to reduce the risk of infection when installing a central line in a patient, which is a, it's a relatively common procedure, putting a line in someone. So on a sheet of paper, Pronovost plotted out the steps to take in order to avoid infection, infections when putting a line in. Doctors are supposed to do this five things. First of all, wash your hands with soap beforehand. Wash your hands with soap. Number two, clean the patient's skin with some antiseptic. Number three, put sterile drapes over the entire patient. Number four, wear a sterile mask, hat, gown, and gloves. And then five, put a sterile dressing over the catheter site once the line is in. So there's five things. Check, check that, check that, check that, check that. These steps are no-brainers. They've been known, they've been taught for years. So it seems silly to make a checklist just for them. Still, Pronovos asked the nurses in his ICU to observe the doctors for a month as they put lines into patients and record how often they completed each step. In more than a third of patients, they skipped at least one step. This five-step checklist was the simple solution that Michigan hospitals used to save 1,500 lives. Think about that for a moment. There was no technical innovations. You know, There were no pharmaceutical discoveries. There was no cutting-edge procedures. The physicians just stopped skipping steps. They just did the basic things that they needed to do. They implemented the answers they already had, but what did they do? Consistently. Did it on a consist consistent basis. You see, we have a tendency to un undervalue answers that we've already discovered. Oh, well, I know that, so we undervalue it. You know, we underutilize old solutions, even if they're the best practices, because they seem like something we've already considered. I remember reading about someone they were talking about, some, some guy, and he went to, he wanted to train with, I think it's Kobe Bryant, some one of the best basketball players in the world. And this guy wanted to train with him. And he said, yeah, sure, you can go and, go and meet me. At, um, I'll be training at four tomorrow. And he said, but hang on, we're at a coaching camp, but we've got something on there. No, no, he says, 4 a.m. Meet me at 4 a.m., I'll be there in the gym. So, 
So the guy showed up before I am. And do you know what he saw Kobe Bryant, who's the, I think he's widely regarded as one of the best. Yeah. Well, actually, it might not have been Kobe Bryant. It might have been LeBron James. One of the two, anyway. Yeah. Some great basketball player, whoever it was. Yeah. He was there at four in the morning. But what do you think he was doing? He was doing the most basic basketball drills at the rack. Yeah. So this is like the best basketball player on the planet. Yeah. And he's doing basic drills. Yeah. Basic footwork drills. Basic shooting drills. Basic... He wasn't doing some amazing things. Yeah. He was doing the basics. Yeah. Why? Because he knew that's what's important. Yeah. That's important. By doing the basics over and over and over again, yeah. he suddenly becomes... You know, I mean, there's a guy that introduced a, a, a thing to improve squash playing. A guy, um, I think it was... Um, Jonah Barrington was the guy that was widely regarded as introducing the idea of ghosting. And I think, I imagine they use this in tennis and stuff as well. Where basically the concept was, is that what he would do to practice squash, he would go and act out, even though there was no ball there. So he'd stand on the tee, have his racket, and he'd go and he'd move into the back corner and he'd play a shot with no ball. He's just picturing it and he's just going back. And so all he's doing is just going through the motions, going through the motions, but just practicing, practicing, just doing that, and they, they call it ghosting. You know, you're doing everything, but there's no ball there. But what happened is that over time, it's just like you learn, your body learns to do that, and then in a the game, you just do it automatically. You know? And it makes amazing improvement. And now all the players do it. They all do it. Why? Is, does it, is that something really complex, or is that something really simple? It's simple. It's really, really basic. So here's the thing. Um... Here's the problem. Everybody already knows that, is what people will say. We already know that. Everybody already knows that. But that's a different thing from everybody already does that. You see, the doctors knew those five steps. They knew them all, but did they always do them? No. Just because a solution is known doesn't mean it's utilised. Even more critical, just because a solution is implemented occasionally doesn't mean it's implemented consistently. Every physician, they knew those steps. But very few did all five steps flawlessly each time. We assume that the new solutions are needed if we want to make real progress. But that just isn't always the case. The pattern is just as present in our personal lives as it is in corporations and governments and hospitals. We waste the resources and ideas at our fingertips because they don't seem new and exciting. There are many examples of behaviours, big and small, that have the opportunity to drive progress in our lives if we would just train them more consistently. No matter what task you're working on, there's a simple checklist of steps you can follow right now. Basic fundamentals that you've known about for years that can immediately yield results if you just practice them more consistently. Progress often hides behind boring solutions and underused insights. You don't need more information. You don't need a better strategy. You just need to do more of what already works. So let's have a look at this. Let's, let's apply this. Let's apply this to what we're talking about. What are the basic things if there's a checklist? For our Christian life, what are some of the basic things that we should be looking at? And I guess, I mean, the first one is just so obvious it, it goes without saying, but it doesn't go without saying, because I'm going to say it. It's, it's, the, it's the fundamental thing. What do we base our lives on? It's the Bible. It's the Bible. It has to be the Bible. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, we sang it before, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That's the thing. If Jesus said, that, that's it's fundamental. You know, First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. We, we saw in Second Peter chapter number 1, verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. How does it come? Through the knowledge. Where do we get this knowledge? In the Bible. And here's the thing. You can look. Jesus over and over. In fact, should, we, might turn, we might turn to some of these. Look at... Um, no, I'll just read them. I'll just read them. because I'll, We'll just make it quick. In Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 3, Jesus said, But he said unto them, Have you not read? Matthew chapter 12, verse number 5. Or have you not read in the law? Matthew chapter 19, verse number 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? Matthew chapter 21, verse 16. And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read? Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures? Would Jesus say that to you? Have you never read this? Have you never read this? We might say, well, I've read through the whole Bible. I've read through the whole Bible multiple times. But what? Are you constantly reading it so it's there in your mind? Or do you let things slip? You know? 
I mean, the, the, I'm just trying to think where it says that. We ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we've heard. Any time we should let them slip. Yep. Must be in um, Hebrews 2, I think it is. Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto him, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures. Matthew 22, verse 31. But it's touching the res- resurrection of the dead. Have you not read? Mark 2, 25. And he said unto him, Have you never read what David did? Mark 4, 13. He said to them, Know you not this parable? You should know about what David's been up to. You should know this parable here. Mark 12, 10. And have you not read this scripture? Mark 12, 24. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not therefore err because you know not the scriptures? Mark 12, 26. And it's touching dead that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses? We need to read this. We need to read this. Luke 6, 3. And Jesus answering them said, Have you not read so much as this? You see, the Bible over and over exhorts us that we should be reading. And if you read the Bible, then you might read some of those exhortations. Yes. 2 Timothy, look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 15. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be in God's word. We need to be studying God's word. We need to be reading God's word. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 13. 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 13. 1 Timothy 4 13. It says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Notice it's in order. Reading first, yeah. then exhortation, then doctrine. Yeah. Why? Because your doctrine has to come from what you've read in the Bible. Your exhortation, your, that's encouraging people to do things or to not do things, that's going to come from what you've read in the Bible. That's why he says, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Isaiah 34, 16 says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. We need to be reading God's word. Look at Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17. Acts 17 and verse number 10. Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 10. <clears throat> Acts 17, 10. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, and also of honourable men which were Greeks, and of men, sorry, of honourable women which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So notice, these People were more noble. Why? They received the word and they searched the scriptures, whether those things were so. They were in the Bible. Why are so many people fooled into false doctrine? Because they're not in the Bible. They're not reading the Bible. Over and over, God exhorts us that we should be reading his word. Look if you would, um, Deuteronomy chapter number 17, Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 14, Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 14. Deuteronomy 17, let just get there myself, verse 14, it says, When thou come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell there, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren, shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee which is not thy brother, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, you shall not henceforth return, you shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he mul- greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him, and it shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord as God, to keep all the words of this law, and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that he turn not aside from the commandment, to the right hand or to the left, to the end he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So this is when they're going to appoint a king, and before it's coming about, he's saying, look, when you do decide to appoint a king, this is what you should do. He's not supposed to multiply horses. He's not, to, he's not supposed to lead you back into Egypt where you came out of. He's not supposed to multiply wives. He's not supposed to multiply silver and gold. Now these are, if you read, these are, these are things that you know, the kings did these things. I mean, they, some of them went back to Egypt to get help. You know, a lot, a lot of them multiplied wives, multiplied silver and gold. Those were things they weren't supposed to do, but here was something they were supposed to do. And if they did those things they weren't supposed to do, chances they probably didn't do what they were supposed to do which is write a copy of this book and read there in day and night. All the days of their life. That's what they were supposed to be doing. But from looking at the lives of them, it suggests that that wasn't what they did. 
So that's the most basic thing. The most basic thing on is check this. Check this is Bible reading. Have you done your Bible reading today? Don't worry about yesterday. What about today? That's what needs to be done first. Do the Bible reading first. Second thing, what about prayer? What about prayer? Turn if you to Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26. This is an important thing that we see Jesus doing over and over again. Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 36. Matthew 26 and verse 36. Here's a very famous account. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now when he said tarry here and watch, he was actually saying, Watch and pray. And he went on a little further and fell on his faith and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he's prayed and he's exhorting his disciples, You need to pray. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. What do we see Jesus doing? He's praying, he's praying, he's praying. Throughout his ministry, Mark chapter 1, verse 35, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. Make it a habitual thing. Have a time, have a place. We're going to pray. James says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth liberty to all men, and it braideth not, it shall be given him. But then he also goes on and says, you have not, because you ask not. You have not, because you ask not. Is that something, is it on your checklist? Is it something you do every day, or some days does it slip? Oh, I didn't pray today. I didn't pray yesterday. I didn't pray. It needs to be something. Why? Because if you don't, bad things are going to happen. Bad things, are, just like the doctors, remember? If they didn't have, they didn't do everything to check, all of the people were getting infections. People were dying. Well, guess what? If you're not reading your Bible, if you're not praying, bad things can come into your life and they can come into the lives of your family members. They can come into the life of your friends, the people around you. Um, third one, and we'll probably just sort of skip past this one because we did so much about it this morning. It's pretty obvious. Coming to church. Coming to church is so essential. Remember we saw in Psalm 26 the importance of the people we associate with. We saw Psalm 92, those that be planted and the house of our God. You know, they're going to flourish. They're going to bring forth fruit. Okay? We saw Hebrews chapter number 10. Let's forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. You know, we saw the importance of the people who are around. Not forsaking the congregation. Not forsaking the assembly. That's just essential. Is that on your checklist? Guess what? For many people, it's not on their checklist. It's not on their checklist. Okay? Guess what? Trouble's going to happen. Trouble's going to happen. When people skip the assembly, when people miss church, and it's, and it's always easy to find a reason to miss church. It's always, there's always something that can come up. There's always something that can come up. Like, oh, well, I'll just miss it this one time. Well, it's the same, it's the same with Bible reading. Well, I can't do Bible reading. I've got to do this instead. You know? I can't pray because I've got to do this instead. It, you know, you heard the expression, more haste, less speed. More haste, it, it doesn't do any good. You know, it's, it's like it's like people that oh, I haven't got enough money to tithe. You know, I can't I can't come and bring the offering to God. I can't you know financially support the work of the Lord because things are a bit tight at the minute. Well, I suggest you go add to your Bible reading, add Haggai to your Bible reading. Go and read Haggai chapter number one, and he'll tell you all about it. You know, you got to, it's like you you've got a, a bag with holes. You're putting your money into a bag with holes. It's disappearing. That's what's happening. Okay, and God says, as he says in Malachi, what will he do? He'll rebuke the devourer. Rebuke the devourer. Anyway, move on from there. What about this? So we've had Bible reading, prayer, coming to church. What about this? Going soul winning. Going soul winning is something that is essential. This is one of the basic things that should be on your checklist, is going soul winning. Look at Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse number 12. Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse number 12. It says, for when... When, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's saying you guys are not mature when you should be. You should be teaching people. And guess what? When you go and preach the gospel, you're teaching people. You're teaching people the Bible. He says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is obeyed, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use 
have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice that. It's by reason of use. Re- the, isn't there a saying? Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. And the fact is, many people will come to church, and they'll come to church over and over again, and they'll listen to sermon after sermon after sermon, but if they don't put it into practice, it's really just going to go in one ear and out the other. That's what's going to happen. James wrote about this. He said, look, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, who beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Doing the work. That's the thing that's going to help you to not forget. I thought you were talking about soul winning. Well, here's the thing. What's the work that he's told us to do? What did Jesus say in Mark 16, 15? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What did he say in, in Matthew chapter number 28? Matthew chapter number 28. And verse number, or whatever it is, right, must at the end there somewhere. Verse number 19. Well, verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Notice go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus said to his disciples, As my Father sent me, so send I you. He's given us a mission to do. And we need to be careful that we do that. You know, I mean, here's one of our theme verses. You know, Jesus said, look, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, they will send forth laborers into his harvest. It's essential. It's important. It's it's a basic thing that should be on the checklist. And guess what? If it's not being done, people are going to get hurt. There's going to be fatalities. Okay, Bible reading, prayer, coming to church, going so on. What about this one? What about memorizing scripture? Memorizing scripture. This is something that is yeah. essential. This is not an optional extra. This is not something that's just, you know, oh, you want to be some special super Christian. No. This is for everybody. Yeah. I mean, isn't this something that children do? Yeah. Memorizing, that's for children. Well, all it is is just, you know, <laughs> each one of us. Yeah. I mean, we all start as babes. And it's, it's so important. Jesus gave us the example in Matthew chapter number 4 when Jesus was tempted by the devil each time Jesus answered it is written it is written there's no way that he had a scroll out there in the, in, in the desert with him he wasn't saying it is written he wasn't sort of saying look because those days, oh, the scroll would have been back in the, in the synagogue anyway it wasn't like you could just go and take it everywhere everyone didn't have their own copy but he said it is written it is written you know God's law was written in his heart you know um, Psalm 119 verse 11 Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee Jesus was sinless Guess what? His word was chock full uh, Sorry, his heart was chock full of God's word Joshua 1.8, we talked about that before You know, this book of law shall not depart out of their mouth but they shall meditate therein day and night It's important Look at um, Proverbs chapter number 6 Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse number 20 Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse number 20 It says, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother Bind them continually Upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. Notice that. Bind them continually. You've got to keep on doing it. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Putting God's word, binding them upon thine heart, tying them about thy neck. It's something you have to do over and over and over. Look at Proverbs chapter number 7. My son, keep my words and lay out my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. It's a command. That's all we're supposed to be doing. Look at Proverbs chapter number 3. Proverbs chapter number 3. You often sing Proverbs chapter 3 in verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall I add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. It's just, it's so important. I can't emphasize this enough. It's so important. We need to memorize God's word. Some of you guys, when you're younger, you would have done it as as part of homeschooling stuff. It's part of your daily, but guess what? It still needs to be part of your daily routine. Why? Because otherwise, it'll slip. You know those chapters that you used to be able to quote? You won't be able to quote them anymore. You have to make it part of your daily checklist. Go through and do these things. And obviously, there's, there's harder ways to do it and there's easier ways to do it. You know, some of the harder ways, the way some of you guys have done it, is just by rote learning. You just go through and you just say the verse over and over and over and over again until you've got it. That's what you do. 
But this, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's easier now, now that we've got these scripture scripture songs. Yes. You know, some of these chapters that we that we, that we sang this morning, we sang First Peter chapter number one. I can quote the entire First Peter chapter number one. How? I didn't wrote learn it. That's right. Just by singing it. That's all it was. Proverbs chapter number three, exactly the same thing. I didn't wrote learn it. I I did it just by singing. Yeah. Now Proverbs chapter four, I can quote you that chapter two. Mm. How can I do that? I did write learn that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's so important. Mm. It's so important that we. Do it over and over again. That's why in every service we sing multiple chapters of God's word. So every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Thursday night, we sing, sing them, and sing them. And put in God's word. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Very important. It should be on your checklist. What about this? We sang this before. How about this? This is something that should be on your checklist. This is something people might not necessarily think of as being on a checklist. What about this? Look at John, chapter number 13. Look at verse 34 and 35. John chapter number 13 and verse 34 and 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Doesn't that sound pretty important? Yeah. It sounds pretty important. Yeah. Maybe it should be on your checklist. Yeah, exactly. Be on your checklist. Look at First John chapter number 4. First John chapter number 4 and verse number 7. First John chapter number 4. Excuse me, in verse number 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him, here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Look across at verse, chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So loving, it's not just saying I love you, it's actually doing things. It's showing your love. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, it goes into great detail, talking about charity. You know, expressing love, charity. Verse number, verse number four. Charity suffereth long and is kind. You want to be loving, then be long suffering, because God is love, and what's God? He's long suffering, and He's kind. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. That's important. It's an important thing. These are the th- these are attributes we should put in our lives. Well, look if you were at First um, Thessalonians chapter number three. First Thessalonians chapter number three and verse number twelve. First Thessalonians chapter number three and verse number twelve. It says, "And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you." God says, look, we should be abounding in love. We should be abounding in love. Sounds like it should be something that's on your checklist. Now, how can you show love? Well, there's lots of different ways. Obviously, you can show love for the lost by going and preaching the gospel. We've already touched on that. What a love for your family. Put on your checklist. Spend time with your family. You know, your spouse. Schedule time. Spend time. Because guess what happens? If you don't schedule it, you'll slip. If you don't make it a habit, if you don't put it on something that's Check that you've done it. Check that you've done it. You say, oh, but you know, it's going to happen automatically. Just like the doctors, they'll wash their hands with soap and they'll do all the other bits. They knew them all. But if they didn't do them, guess what happened? People got hurt. People got hurt. Last thing we'll finish up to, um, last point, and we kind of touched on this a little bit already, was like taking action. We saw what James said, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Actually taking action. It's good with all these... Put, you know, putting God's word in our heart, you know, doing the praying, reading the Bible, doing all these sort of things, coming to church. But you also have to put into practice the things that the Bible says to do. You know, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. And to 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 increase and abound, you've got to take action. You've got to do something. I mean, imagine if you imagine if you bought a gym membership. You know, you've gone from bought a gym membership, but then you never use it. In fact, that, that's, I think that's what gyms actually rely on. If everyone that owned a membership for the gym turned up, they wouldn't all fit. They, don't, they, they sell all these memberships. 
because they know that it's only a small percentage of people they actually, they actually turn up regularly. Okay? But that's the thing. If you purchase, the, yeah, I've got my membership, here it is in my pocket. And so what physical effect is that going to have on you? None. If you don't go to the gym, it's going to have no effect whatsoever. Well, here's the thing. How much effect is it going to have if you read the Bible? Maybe every day. You come to church every time it's open. You know, you, 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 you spend time in prayer. But you don't actually do anything. You don't actually do anything. You know, you're praying, God, lead me and guide me. And God's like, you're not moving. You're like this car that's parked. You've got to actually go somewhere. You've got to do something. Okay? And to make an improvement, that's what you've got to do. You've got to make an improvement. I've talked about this before. Like, you know, remember the arm and the cast. You've got an arm that's a cast. And what's going to happen to that arm that's in the cast? It's not going to get bigger and musclier. It's going to waste away. Why? Because you're not using it. It's important. It's so important. And obviously, there's a balance there, you know. You've got, you can have overuse. You know, if you're using something too much, yep. then you're going to get injured. It's going to be problems. But, of course, underuse, the same thing. Okay. Underuse, overuse. We need, we need a balance. Sounds like you've got a schedule. Yep. The right amount of time, taking action. And this is when it's going to happen. The title of the sermon this evening is Continuous Improvement. Continuous improvement. God wants us to increase and abound in every good work. We shouldn't be satisfied with where we are currently. It's a problem. Being satisfied. Psalm 17 and verse number 15. Psalm 17, turn if you were to uh, Philippians chapter number 3. Psalm 17 and verse number 15 says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when? I shall be satisfied when I await with thy likeness. And it's the time when we're satisfied is when we're like Jesus. You know, when I, when I wait in his likeness. That's the time we're going to be satisfied. So don't be satisfied with where you are right now. Look at Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 12. Not as I had already attained, I had already perfect. <clears throat> but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. You see, you might have made mistakes in the past. You've let things get off track. But guess what? Get back on track. He says, look, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press for the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you've got off track, it doesn't matter. The Bible says, a, um, the just man falleth seven times. What does he do? He riseth up again. Get back on track. Look at um, chapter number one of Philippians, chapter number one and verse number six. And, and when, when I talk about not being satisfied, we do realise that the Bible also says that we should be content. We should be content. So it's not that we're, it's not that we're you know, oh, what's the word for it? We should be thankful. You know, it says in, in Philippians 4, verse number um, 11, not that I speak in respect of one, for I've learned in what sort of state I am there with to be content. And that's he's talking about. Whether he's got a lot, whether he's got nothing, he's content. But was he satisfied? No, he wasn't satisfied. He was pressing toward the mark. He had more that he wanted to do. Look at um, chapter 1 and verse number 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so here's the thing. We need to realise that we need to be constantly increasing and abounding. And it's not that it has to be a massive amount. I, 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 you know, I've, I've been reading this many chapters, and I'm, I'm just going to double it. It's probably not the wisest idea. Just maybe add a chapter a day. Yeah. Maybe add a couple of chapters, maybe. Yeah. But just a little bit. You know, I haven't been memorising. Okay, let's try. Memorise one verse. Memorise one verse today. You do one verse today, and then the next day, refresh that verse, and then do another verse. Yeah. You know, just little steps. One percent over, what was it, one percent per day over a year? It's like 37 times. Yeah. Okay? We need to realise that our lives... They're kind of a bit like a garden. Now, to be honest, I'm a bit, when I start talking about gardens, I'm out of my depth here. I'm out of, I should be, maybe Doug should be preaching on this. But from what I gather, from what I've heard, it takes continuous effort to produce a great garden. You know, you've got to tend the plants, you've got to water, you've got to weed. But it's not that you just do one day. You know, I, actually I know people that like that. They let the garden, they turn into a wilderness and they have one day and they just demolish it. And then the same thing happens over time. But those gardens that go through that, that, that sort of, you know, it's like they've been hit by a nuclear bomb yeah. and then the wilderness returns again and then six months later something else happens. 
Are they great looking, amazing gardens? They're not really. I mean, they look tidier when you've been in it, you know, when you've taken the, the sickle to them. But but they're not that's not a great garden. I mean a great garden is something that has daily, continual. You know? Some of those lawns, you've seen some of those country houses. Those country houses over in over in England, so I haven't been there, but I've I've seen pictures of it, you know. And it's like the lawn looks like a bowling green. Yeah. You know? How did it get like that? Yeah. Hundreds of years it's been manicured. Yeah. You know, just these continual improvements. It takes that continual effort. Okay? Actually turn to John fifteen. We'll finish up. John number John chapter number fifteen. You see, making these little changes can produce a big effect. Little changes over time. Oh, look, here you go. John 15. I am the true vine. My father is a husband. Where's his garden? Yes. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, so that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. What does it sound like God's after? He wants more fruit. He wants us to be fruitful. Now you're clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except you abide in me. So we understand, we're getting the source, the ability to do this comes from God. But we still have to take action. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. Men gather them, and cast them in the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. Well, that sounds like having God's word written in your heart, doesn't it? And my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will. It sounds like praying, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. You see, we need to realise that over time, the little actions that we do, they can produce a big effect. Remember that 1%? That 1%? Remember, remember the, the cycling team? Just little changes, little changes. Here's the thing. What are the areas that you are going to make some changes in? What are the areas? What are the areas you think, I haven't really been doing what I should be doing? In fact, in that area, I've actually been getting 1% worse. I've been going backwards. I've been doing worse. Because you might not notice it now, but over time, it's going to go down and down and down. Each one of us should be in a state of continuous improvement. Continuous improvement as we seek to walk in God's will and bring glory to Him. Here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Be this fruitful garden. You know what I talked about in Psalm 1? You know, not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, but meditating God's word day and night. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. I pray you'd help each one of us to continually improve. To continually improve in all areas of our lives. To look for specific things, specific changes that we can make that will make us more effective servants for you. That will make us better husbands, better wives, better employees, better better, better siblings, better, better children, whatever it may be. Help us to walk in a way that pleases you. To make those little changes. And to avoid making the little wrong changes. The little minus 1%. The little minus 1%. Help us to continually improve. That we would increase and abound more and more. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.